So the anniversary waltz. Okay, what's the story on the anniversary waltz? Well, it comes from Russia. It was composed by a Jew in the middle of the 19th century. First recordings of it are already you know, made in uh, the last decade of the 19th century. So how did it get to a New York City recording of a Greek-Turkish hybrid performance in 1919? I called uh, Dr. Martin Schwartz, the head of the Middle Eastern Studies Department at the University of California, Berkeley, um, one of the world's great linguists in old uh, Middle Eastern languages, the world's foremost expert on the, the poetry of Zoroaster. If you have any questions about Zoroaster, you call Marty. He's the guy. Um, and he said, well, let, let me think about it. How did the anniversary waltz get from Russia or the Ukraine to Anatolia or the Balkans? Well, there was a boat that went across the Black Sea in 1897, and there were, let me think, 12 Jews on it. So it must have been one of them. I have no idea if that's the right answer or not, but it's a great answer. This guy has exactly the right job for his brain. So we, we rely on these experts for these answers about things, and who knows, really. That waltz, the anniversary waltz, comes up again as the 6-8 section of Chemil Bey's composition, Shadabaram. <laughs>
vast majority of the stuff I've, I've played so far, well, pretty much everything, you know, pretty well fits under this kind of banner heading that I used for the project of uh, an Ottoman American diaspora. You know, people from Anatolia or you know Ottoman territory uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, I, the one person who was included on the collection who um, would have most fiercely disliked being put under that banner heading is this next guy. This is uh, Satoria Stasinopoulos. Uh, Stasinopoulos was born sometime between 1878 and 1891 in a little tiny village called Daphne, way up the mountains of the Morea, Peloponnesus in southern Greece. Um, uh, Calavrita is the district, and he actually gives a shout out to Calavrita on this record. Um, biographically, he you know, lived in Chicago 1906 to 1909, went back to Greece for some reason for a few years, came back to the US, his Ellis Island information when he comes back says he has a big scar on his face. God only knows what he got himself into. But um, he did play in the same circle of musicians as people like Marika and Andujan. He used clarinetists in common with you know, that scene. But he wasn't playing in the same kind of nightclubs that were going on in New York City. He was playing mainly in little coffee houses in the port uh, down around the bottom of the island of Manhattan in Tribeca, uh, which were populated with Greek sailors a lot of the time. And what he was playing was not this cosmopolitan sort of stuff, this you know, hybridized ethnic stuff. It was backwoods, rural, Greek, folk, uh, hillbilly music is what it is. And this one in particular carries some, uh, the, in, in American uh, music, the idea of hillbilly music, country music, comes with a certain kind of right-wing uh, cachet, comes with a certain, like, uh, God's guts and guns is a slogan you'll hear uh, in the American South where I live all the time, as people's sort of core belief system. Stasinopoulos shared that core belief system in spades. And this particular song is a piece of uh, saber-waving, blood-dripping, right-wing, racist, uh, uh, anti-Turkish hate is what it is. It's a, a ballad of an actual historical figure named Capitan Michaelis Caracas, who was a rebel chieftain leader in the Greek uprising of 1897. Um, Nikos Kazantzakis later wrote a book about Caracas called, uh, it was translated into English as Freedom or Death. Um, and uh, Caracas was, he says, the kind of guy who uh, did nothing but smoke his pipe and stare at the mountains except when he was killing Turks. This kind of hero of Greekness who has to also be against somebody else. So despite all of this uh, political miasma that Stasinopoulos represents, um, he is, I think, one of the best singers I've ever heard on a record. And he's a demonic player of the lauto, which is a, a beautiful instrument itself. So this one, I think, uh, is, is well worth hearing uh, for that reason, if nothing else. So recorded in New York City, he made 125 recordings in New York. This is the first of any of them that have been reissued uh, in, in the US. And only about a dozen have been reissued in Greece about 10 years ago. Um, somebody who has been uh, utterly forgotten. Nope, that's not him. This is.
kind of like a toast is the, the kind of thing that he's, he's playing. I want to play one other um, very, very prideful Greek man in New York City uh, who was a, a big player on the scene, but who I had to leave off the, the compilation. Um, I told you that in uh, 1912 there were the first recordings in Turkish and that uh, they were hits. Gradually over time there became more and more uh, popular musicians, more and more recordings of musicians in the United States uh, from uh, the Balkans and Levant and uh, Anatolia. But that I, I had to end the, the whole project about 1930, which is where the industry just drops off and the, the recordings sort of drop off. This one I didn't include on the set because it was made in 1932. Um, it was one of only six sides recorded by this guy at a single session. Um, and it's the end of one thing and the beginning of something else. Um, this is a record that changed uh, Greek music forever, by itself, this one. Um, and once this record was made, uh, Greek popular music was just like never the same. This is a guy whose uh, Americanized name was Jack Gregory. Um, Jack Gregory had uh, two ways of making a living his whole life. Uh, he was a bookie, he took bets, and he was a dope dealer, he sold weed. And he was well known to basically every Greek musician in New York City during the 20s, 30s, and 40s as, you know, if you need something, we'll take you over to Jack's and he'll fix you up. And his apartment uh, served as a, a, a hash den. It was a place where everybody just went and smoked and hung out. And there exist um, stacks of reel-to-reels that his son owns of Jack Gregory playing with pretty much every important Greek musician that came through New York City. Uh, he wants a million dollars for them. He is not going to get a million dollars for them. But anyway, uh, this record was uh, came out in 1932 and is not the first performance of the bazooki on record, but it's one of the first, and it's the first hit. Uh, the bazooki was not played in New York City by Greek musicians uh, before this because it was a disreputable instrument. It was an instrument that was played by people and associated with two places, uh, prison and hash dens, and just not the kind of people you would want to be hanging around, not the kind of people you'd want people to think you were. Um, so it was, uh, most of the instruments that Greek musicians played were violin and cymbalum and other instruments basically associated with the Ottoman courts, or else, in a few cases, uh, uh, guitars and mandolins, which are associated basically with Italy. Um, the bazooki 